Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor. And towards the end of this video today, I'm going to show you someone that I found that works at Ripple and has worked at Ripple for a while, and I just wasn't aware. It's possible that it was already uh, public knowledge, but I did not know about it, and I found out some further information about the person. I'm going to show you who this is and what they do and how they're connected or how they got involved in Ripple. Kind of interesting. Um, also, but first I wanted to show cover this. This is from yesterday. Yesterday, the Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin took a price took a dive in price like in a really quick span of time. This article is kind of talking about it. First mover Bitcoin rattled by the transfer of Satoshi coins that might not be Satoshi's. Even idle speculation of the mysterious uh, Bitcoin founder and Satoshi Nakamoto might be moving around a small batch of cryptocurrency appeared sufficient to spook the market on Wednesday. Bitcoin slid 2.3%, retreating after a four-day rally and pushing the price down to about $9,500. Okay, and so um, it says, it says uh, there was a whale, whale alert from this Twitter account that sent a message indicating that a recent transfer of 40 bitcoins worth $391,000 might be from a possible Satoshi-owned wallet that had lain dormant since the first few months of 2009, soon after Bitcoin itself had launched. Now, when I, when I see this, this is a, an obvious question to those of you. I used to hold some Bitcoin. I don't have any Bitcoin now. But the Bitcoin maximalists for, for years now, um, they hate Ripple and XRP for obvious reasons. But for years now, the, all we've heard from these guys is, oh, yeah, Ripple's, they're wanting to dump XRP on, on you, and, and they own most of the XRP. In other words, trying to scare people into thinking that Ripple, <clears throat> because they control the supply, is going to somehow do wrong by investors and dump the XRP, right? So... Um, with that being the, the premise, if you think about that for a minute, those same people that are, that are now remember, Ripple put the XRP in, in escrow with guidelines as to how they could uh, bring it out of escrow and, and sell it if they wanted to. Well, think about the Bitcoin people. What the Bitcoin people are doing, those same people that are, that are saying that, or basically say, well, we don't know who owns a large percentage of the Bitcoin. His name's Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't know if it's a guy, a girl, a, a we don't know if it's China or Russia. We don't know. But but we're going on a leap of faith and we're going to attack Ripple and XRP when when they're completely transparent about where the XRP is. But these people don't even know who, who Satoshi Nakamoto is. And this article by itself and the events of yesterday prove how ridiculous that concept is and how, how pitiful these people, uh, the, the idea that they're going to be sitting out there and attacking Ripple, who is being completely transparent while they're sitting here and don't even know who owns this large stash of Bitcoin. And it's proven now that, that just 40, just the, the, the whiff of that Bitcoin moving around, not even being sold, scares the the market enough to dump just like that. And these, who, so the question is, who are the dumb ones? <laughs> is it, I don't think it's the XRP. We know exactly where the XRP is and who holds it. Um, so, um, and then, so to further illustrate this point, here's Chris Larson, and he hints that we don't know that it's a he or a she. It could be state actors. L listen to this. The business model behind the uh, uh, the inventor of Bitcoin, who is still anonymous, I guess, you know, goes by the name Satoshi. Um, it looks like he kept about the equivalent of maybe 10% of the Bitcoins total. Looks like they've never moved, so we don't know what's going to happen with those. You can see them in the blockchain. Uh, but that was sort of his or her or their, their business model. The business model... <laughs> 
This person that nobody, a person or company or state or China or Russia owns 10% roughly of Bitcoin. And these guys, that, that's not a concern, but it's a concern that Ripple has this XRP and it's all sitting there in escrow where you can see it. Everybody knows what it is, what the deal is, but Bitcoin's not scary at all, right? Well, now, for those of you that don't like bad language, I have to play you this clip. You, I've played it before. So if you got kids listening, close their ears, put something over their ears, or get them, get them to leave the room. So here we go. This is Dan Payne and what he said about Bitcoin. Everything's, everything's cash. No, no. Why no Bitcoins and why no cryptocurrency? Well, um, bit, Bitcoins, I called the top of the market in December 2017 when it was $19,600. I said... If you have Bitcoin, sell half, keep half. This is the top. Nobody listened to me. If you knew who was really behind Bitcoin, really behind Bitcoin, you would run as fast as you fucking could to sell it. I know. 100%. If you knew who owned Bitcoin or who started Bitcoin, you and you had Bitcoin, you couldn't sleep at night. I know. Hundred percent. And when the real founder of Bitcoin comes out, it is my humble opinion, and there's nothing humble about me, Bitcoin will go to fucking zero. One day. And I, a microsecond, whoop, like that. Then last question. And as I said, you know who's behind Bitcoin? Putin. <laughs> it's a Ruski conspiracy to fuck up the American economy and the world. It's a long range plan he started seven, eight years ago. He's going to see the demise of the Western financial world while he's still the head of Russia. He's going to, live, he's going to be there long enough. And, he, and, he, and he's already hacked into the... All right. <clears throat> so there you go. So I, my contention is uh, I feel a lot better with my XRP than I do with... Uh, a digital asset that is owned 10% or so by some guy or nation state or whatever that we don't even know who it is. You can have that. Okay. Now, Ashish Birla um, had tweeted this out there. They're, they're, he's tweeting out the Stuart Alderati thing about for, where the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau um, had, had talked about rip, how they believe Ripple and Ripple's product could allow banks and credit unions to know the exact and final amount of, of recipients remittances. It says, "Glad we all, glad we all, glad we all agree that correspondent banking is outdated in every sense, opaque, expensive, and slow. Consumers deserve transparency. Great to see CFPB recognizing RippleNet's capabilities and the use of XRP for cross-border payment settlement in this regard. Sure seems like the regulators are getting in order here." All right, let me get rid of these things here. Okay, now CS May 144K sent me this. from This is from Dillip Brown. Now, this is interesting too right here. Dillip Brown, let me see. He tweeted this out yesterday. Now, he's retired from Ripple, remember. Congrats on Crypto Cowboy, and that is Craig DeWitt. Um, and this Patrick Thien, Thielen, still remember you two driving all night to make that meeting with the Atlanta Fed. And this is a tweet from Craig DeWitt. Very excited to join the Faster Payments uh, Council cross-border working group. <clears throat> Some heavy hitters in this team, making sure Americans can pay anyone, anywhere, anytime, faster payments. Um, and then Craig DeWitt uh, said, yeah, how could I forget? Uh, drive all night from Nashville because of that big storm. We made it through. And here's a picture of Craig DeWitt and Dillip Rowell in front of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Folks. Does my, does my seven-year-old need to draw you a picture again? In fact, he got mad at me last night. Now that I'm talking about that, he got mad at me last night about, um, I'll tell you what I did. He, I played a joke on him. He was, um, 
he was in the shower and I got some uh, glass of water and poured it over the shower and poured it on it. it made him mad he does not like to be messed with so he said I'm gonna tear up one of your XRP pictures just for that <laughs> so he did um, but if my seven-year-old needs to draw you a picture here he can now okay now Brian Melancholy XRP sent me this Wrath of Kahneman, in their weekly report, New Ripple user FX Coin states that they believe XRP use will expand to B2B and large enterprise transactions. And they are planning the first, demo, uh, the, the first demonstration experiment of XRP remittance between large enterprises in Japan. Um, and, I think, and he says, what are the, what are the large enterprises? SBI is, of course, deeply invested in FX coin. Also, FX coin is intended to create a, create swap markets, according to this Bloomberg, Bloomberg article. All right. And then there's XRP Bart had sent me this. This is, um, remember, Forte is the gaming company that Ripple invested in, I think, through spring. Forte CEO and co-founder Josh Williams on the creative economic opportunities that blockchain unlocks in games thanks to a16z now a16z that is andreessen horowitz who is also an investor in ripple we're going to talk about andreessen horowitz a little bit later here in the video but you know how i keep telling you everything's connected everyone's connected all this is connected i'm going to connect a lot of it right now so forte this guy was doing a youtube interview let me pull up another sheet so I can get to the time. So I'm watching this. This is Forte. Um, this is one of the guys from Forte here that's speaking, Josh Williams. Um, I don't know if that's Josh Williams or that is, but it doesn't matter. This guy thinks with Forte. So listen to what he says for the, this minute here. So. Uh, and you can do the same thing in a pseudonymous world with, with blockchain um, as well. What, one thing that is really interesting to think about, which blockchain could unlock, is is the idea of sovereign identity and um, the ability for players to uh, carry an identity from game to game in a way that is uh, verifiable, trustlessly. Um, and that's something that's not really possible in, in games today. Uh, but when you, when you can do that, you could, you could say things like, hey, I was the leader of this, the most successful guild in World of Warcraft. I mean, I... I, Josh was not actually that person, but whoever that was could say that. And then maybe that helps them recruit players in another game in the future. So you can use. Okay. So he said sovereign identity. Well, words mean things, folks. And so I was I've been talking about Greg Kidd. And I remember <laughs> this all ties together. Remember, Greg Kidd was one of the first 10 guys at Ripple. He's the guy that's in that video that said we went straight to the treasury when I, when I first got to Ripple. Okay. Well, this is from his Twitter feed, SSI Incubator vid. Um, so I didn't know what the SSI Incubator was. When you go to the SSI Incubator, this is an incubator that's um, the self-sovereign identity incubator. And remember, this guy is now one of the CEO or co-founder of Global ID. And Chris Larson and Karen Gifford, both from Ripple, are on the board there. Right? So... But this self-sovereign is an incubator for this sovereign, this organization here, sovereign, which is uh, personally manage your digital IDs online with sovereign network, an open source project creating a global public utility for self-sovereign identity. Now, I find it interesting who is um, who the members are on this. If you look at the current members on this. So you can see who all is involved. I mean, that's what's going on, folks, is they're creating um, a standardization of identity that's going to work with all of this blockchain infrastructure. <clears throat> IBM, there you go. So <clears throat> we've shown you that I be, how IBM is, is working with Stellar and also, in my opinion, Ripple. Um, and then as you go, here's the contributing donors. Global ID is right there, which is Greg Kidd's thing. You might, you'll probably recognize plenty of these companies. But as you go down through here, Cisco is on the list. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, IBM, NEC. And then as you keep going out, whoops, there's R3 right there at the very center of all of this. All right. So 
stay let's stay on Greg Kidd for a minute. So I was just going through his Twitter feed and he says, First time at the St. Louis Fed brings back memories, long time since I've seen the arch. Um, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. This, this is bringing back, bringing back memories from there. Remember, he was at, I believe it was the New York Federal Reserve before he was at Ripple. Okay. All right. And this is his hard yaka. We've talked about this before. Here's some of his investments. And I was talking about, um, uh, talking about him yesterday with regard to this, um, link to that he's, that he's involved with. So I went and found some more clips with Greg Kidd. And these are pretty interesting clips. Listen to what he says here. Great. So there's a new presentation I'll be giving this year. And again, it's it's a little untimely right now. We, we have the, the COVID opportunity and everybody's talking about that. Had COVID not intervened, I do believe right now there was a agreement by both Democrats and Republicans in this country that a number of the big tech companies had too much power. Um, and we're gonna look to do some things to clip the wings of a bunch of the technology players. You, you're seeing it still concerns with Amazon, concerns with Google, concerns with Facebook. It's not just in the US, it's in Europe. Um, so one of the questions that's gonna come out of this is there's been a lot of blockage of innovation because of the way that Facebook in particular has allowed others to use its data in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, Facebook is itself pivoting to move away from its sort of social network model to more instrumental forms of messaging. I do believe we're gonna see a transformation from the way that companies built by selling data to basically ad-based schemes to more instrumental forms of how super apps are gonna work. So Facebook is working hard to integrate WhatsApp with a wallet, Calibra, um, and new forms of groups with identity so that the people using Facebook are no longer fake identities. You have super apps coming out of China. I think we're beginning to look at an era where people, are, instead of having all these fragmented apps on their phone, there's gonna be a new generation of apps that are more like the WeChat world. And there'll be a lot of casualties, a few winners. And so that's an area I'm keeping a very close eye on. It also depends on what happens when the governments begin to pressure Google and Facebook to change their practices um, as to who has access to data. The fact that Visa bought Plaid to kind of get control over who has access to data in an open banking environment, all of these issues are on what I call the reg tech frontier. And so they're going to be a change to the rules of the game, and that's going to create a new set of winners and losers. So I do believe that there's an opportunity for the next, you know, not just unicorns or 10 unicorns, but 100 unicorns will come out of folks that can figure out how to thrive in an environment. You may need to litigate to innovate, but, but I'm in that world. So some of my biggest bets right now involve litigating to open up access to data that has been controlled, whether it's controlled by Facebook or just think about the reputational data that, that Uber has or Airbnb has. Who owns that data? Do users own their own data or do companies own the data because you signed terms of use that turned it over? And so when users get control of their data, there'll be a whole new set of innovation that's going to happen. That, that, that's the area where I'm looking over the horizon. Okay, that was one interesting clip. The, the part I wanted to get you to get out of that is, so he's telling you that there's a concerted effort by the, the U.S. government to rein in at the Amazons, the Facebooks, the Googles, and because they don't want them to be too powerful. Well, I've made this point before, and the, and the whole premise, this whole silly, totally silly, by the way, premise that Ripple is going to control all of this XRP from now to the end of time, it doesn't, it does, that doesn't sync with what you just heard him say. I've talked about antitrust and how I don't believe that that's how this goes down because it's not, it's not, I don't believe, I know it doesn't because the U S government is not going to let XRP moon. And then all of a sudden you've got this company that, that is, that is more powerful than a, a country not going to happen. That's not how things happen in the United States. That XRP, I don't, I don't know how they're, how they're going to do it. I don't know if they've 
pre-allocated it or if they've or if they how, how it's going to be earmarked or whatever we don't know exactly how what i do know is that uh, a um company in the united states of america is not going to be allowed without having their doors kicked in to create this have this digital asset and i'm not saying ripple created it open coin created it and then donated it to ripple right they're not gonna it's not gonna go down that way where they're able to to sell this this digital asset and be doing this for seven eight years and then uh, yeah we're just gonna let it go to a hundred bucks and you guys are gonna be mega trillion that this company's gonna be worth trillions of dollars and all this that's not how this happens at all folks it's been in my opinion the government has been right there all along the way at least from the time that greg kidd got involved and has been involved in every aspect of what's happened at ripple in my opinion now let's go tim draper is also in this video now tim draper as you know all he ever talks about is bitcoin i've always i've always believed that he was an investor in ripple as well um greg kidd in this clip uh, after tim draper talks will will talk about how he's kind of following Tim's lead. So you can be assured that Tim Draper is heavily involved in all of the above. Watch this. For a few months, what, what would you be doing? Or what, <laughs> I'd sell everything, and I have. I'd sell everything in the public markets. I'd be buying um, private companies and startups because they're the ones who are going to lead us to new to the new world. And I'd be buying Bitcoin and I would be selling real estate. Um, I think I'd get out of the commercial real estate business for a long time. It's going to be a long time before that. Uh, about half the people I know that are operating this way like it. I personally don't. But about half of them like it and they want to stay home. So I'm, I'm actually thinking commercial real estate is just going to go. But but it's startups that pull us out of every one of these slumps and they take us to a new world a new way of operating new way of thinking uh so i think i actually am pretty well situated i did sell pretty much everything i've got in the public markets um and uh and i've got a bunch of bitcoin so that's kind of where i'm uh, that's where i'm going it's more startups more bitcoin right. more crypto this decentralized world, I mean, I, I'll take it a little further than Bart did. I, I think it's opening up the globe. I think our, our, the whole earth is opening up and the, um, and the tribalism that we've had in the past is, is, a, is slowly disintegrating as a, as a relevant force. And all this talk about regulation, well, that, all that stuff is, is these people who are still tribal trying to hang on to their power. And so then they're telling us to stay in place, wear a mask, turn around three times, wash your hands. Um, it, I have the feeling we are about to go into a time where, where this world really opens up. And that will be fabulous for the global economy. I mean, when, when you have trade barriers, it's not good. But when you have the, the open world economy, everybody benefits and we have this an, an enormous breakthrough. So I think we're going to move from tribalism to globalism, and it's going to be led by the decentralized world. And that starts with Bitcoin. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tim. And uh, Greg, are you uh, stepping into this environment? Are you pausing? How are you thinking about it? So, I, so I'm doubling down on all of our ecosystem companies. I, I'm basically following Tim's game plan, and I've let everybody know in our ecosystem that is contributing to this new, if you will, decentralized, more user-centric world that, that we're going for. This is one of the, the few times in my life when I feel like the planets are aligned. Sometimes things have to get bad enough for them to get better. Right. And, and COVID has been a great kick in the pants. Um, and so to, 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 I'm, I'm just basically following Tim's guidance, sell public, invest private, invest private selectively in the world that's going to contribute to this new decentralized reality because at a time when everybody's going tribal and anti-global well like the long-term bet is hey that's not going to work and so right. you know unless you're going to go back to a highlander model where a couple of 
couple of guys with really big clubs beat the crap out of everyone else, you're going to come up with something that's decentralized that's going to just work. And it was messy, just like at the time when like the World Wide Web came along. Who would have thought at that time that the World Wide Web was going to slay CompuServe, AOL, et cetera, whatnot. AOL at the time was like, with its merger with Time Warner, was the most valuable company in the world. Like, my gosh, what a different world and what a messy, decentralized world the World Wide Web was compared compared to those. So it is a bit of a crapshoot to figure out who's going to be one of those winners in this new reality, but but I'm all in in that new reality. Thanks, Greg. And I think I think they pretty much told you there. <laughs> These guys he said it he said he was doubling down. <laughs> so all right. Now, I was um I was on Ripple's website and I happened to be scrolling down and I saw someone and maybe I'm just going crazy here, but I don't think I had ever seen this lady in the list. These are the um these are the people, the, le the leadership at Ripple, and I don't think I had ever seen this lady right here in this list. She's right above Ethan Beard, um, and and she she's worked at Ripple since um, I'll I'll show you here in a second. She's worked at Ripple since like 2018, I believe, but I've never heard of her. I don't remember seeing this lady, at least on the website, Kirsten. Ha Kirsten Hollers is SVP of People and Communications at Ripple. Prior to joining Ripple, Kirsten was a partner at the Hatch Agency, where she spent three years working with Ripple to, to help build and grow the communications program. She also led agency teams for, for companies like Ancestry, Ancestry, Dropbox, and Stitch. Fix. Uh, in 2012, she served as a partner at Ad Andres and Horowitz, counseling the firm's portfolio companies on their marketing programs. Before this, she led this, this, this. Um, she was at Hytel, AOL, Yahoo. Those all sound familiar. And I'm going to show you why in a second. Kirsten was a, um, it says sh she spent three years working with Ripple to help build and grow the communications program. So this is the company that she was at, the Hatch Agency. This is a PR company. And this is where apparently they have been working with Ripple on their PR, uh, their, I guess the way Ripple, their, their uh, reputation and whatnot over the last three years. And now, and before that, she was at um, Andres and Horowitz, which is one of the first investors in Ripple. But, but there's another tie in. Look at this. Um, this is her uh, resume here on or the, her LinkedIn, and it shows Hytel. Um, AOL, Yahoo, Outcast, Oracle. Um, anyway, but the bottom line is you'll see there that there's somebody else from Ripple who has almost that exact same resume. That would be Brad Garlinghouse. Um, if you go down his, he was at Hytale, AOL, Yahoo, same as she was. So I got to looking around and um, found this article. Kirsten Hollers moves from AOL Com VP to Andres and partner. Uh, PR guru Kirsten Hollers is moving from AOL to VP partner at Andres and Horowitz. We've confirmed with Andres and from her former boss, Brad Garlinghouse. Kirsten is a rock star, ran all the PR marketing for the entire mobile apps and commerce team. She was and uh, she was a love manager of the team and cultural ambassador um, of what the AOL culture should be. She uh, she had gone from Outcast to Yahoo to Dig to AOL following executive Brad Garlinghouse in his career post Yahoo. Garlinghouse notably exited AOL recently and is working on something new and undisclosed for the first time in a while. Howlers obviously will not be joining him. OK, so at this time, Garlinghouse is working on something uh, that's undisclosed now. If it was undisclosed, this is December 12th of 2011. So, and, and remember, also remember this, this is TechCrunch, which TechCrunch is owned, I think still owned, by Michael Arrington, who runs Arrington XRP Capital. So, if, if let me go back, let's look at this for a second. So, he, let's see, I'm trying to get the timeline here. This is Brad Garlinghouse. Um, AOL, he, and it's what it looks like. Okay, and now I see it. 
So AOL and what was undisclosed must have been the high tail. So he was going to high tail. But here's here's what's weird about this. Let me see for a second. Let's go back to this article. She I'm trying to see if she if it says that she was at high tail because this is she's gonna AOL VP to partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Okay, she's moving from AL AOL. To, on December 2011, let's see what if this matches up. 2000, she's at AOL from, okay, so, okay, so maybe she, she's leaving there, but it says she was there till 2000. Oh, okay, there, okay, that date works. So then she goes there, but after that, she goes to Hightail. So she left there, then she came to work with Brad Growinghouse at Hightail. That's what, that's what went on. All right. So now, but, but what's interesting here is that she, you got Andrews and Horowitz, you got Brad Garlinghouse. Now, here's a, here's the only video I could find of this lady. This, she's apparently talking about, let's see if she went to school here. St. Mary's College. Yes, she went to school at St. Mary's. This is some promo she did for St. Mary's. Watch this. I was actually a communications major. My first PR job out of St. Mary's was given to me by a St. Mary's alum who I still very much keep in touch with. I went straight into a job doing public relations in San Francisco for a small marketing firm and from there have just really focused on PR. I went from small marketing firm to Oracle. From there, I went on to do uh, PR at what was then a small boutique agency in San Francisco called Outcast Communications. They now are the agency of record for you name it, Yahoo, Facebook, Amazon. From Outcast, I spent four years doing corporate communications for Yahoo. From Yahoo, I went to a social network startup called Dig. I wasn't quite ready to leave, but was recruited by my old boss at Yahoo, Brad Gollinghouse, to come help him reinvigorate the AOL brand here. So now I've been at AOL in the corporate communications department now for about three months. I am a big fan of working closely and partnering with the people and the executives that you get to team up. That's all I really wanted you to hear that she, uh, her boss was Brad Garlinghouse and then she goes, she's able to go to Andrews and Horowitz and then um, that uh, agency, the Hatch agency, where she worked on Ripple's reputation, and now she goes to work for Ripple. I wanted to finish with this um, from Anders Lundberg. This is worth repeating. Nothing is impossible in 2020, and the digital asset investor totally agrees. How many things have you seen this year that you thought you would never see so far? And remember, we're in the year of the digital asset per Ripple. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends and family that we're in the year of the digital asset and nothing is impossible in 2020. Thanks for listening.